they just make what has already been a wicked situation, I think, worse. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Coleridge, don't the current disclosure requirements placed on corporations engaging in political advertising alleviate the chances of corporate takeover of the political campaign or of our elections since citizens are made aware of corporate involvement and can discount the message accordingly? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, my understanding of Citizens United is it did not mandate disclosure. Um, there still is uh, sort of left it in the hands of Congress, and even that anemic sort of step. I mean, there were a lot of changes, a lot of you know uh, hand wringing uh, by members of both parties. Though it's horrible, we need to try to make the situation better. And one of the things that people said is we should force disclosure. I mean, who can be against the right to know where your uh, super PAC money is coming from? But even that anemic reform measure could not get past Congress. That to me says that corporations have an incredible amount of power. Um, would disclosure help? Well, I guess to a very limited extent, in, in the same way that, uh, I don't know, that you as a consumer, uh, it would be better to know that what you're eating you know, has a certain amount of parts per millions of poison is, is good to know. You know, right to know doesn't mean anything if you don't have the right to decide. And I think that's the salient issue. Right to know is good if you're a consumer. Right to decide is more important if you are a democratic citizen. And that's where I think the prism or the lens that we look through should be focused on. Not right to know, right to decide. Right to decide comes from being in charge and being able to authorize and being able to instruct and being able to dictate what our own creations can and cannot do. The, the language is a language of suppression. It's used the term many times, suppression. We have to control these other people. Again, remember we're talking about people. We're talking about us. My wife owns a corporation. She's a really nice person. When I hear them say, we want to suppress and control these people, I take that personally. I'm on the board of several nonprofits. When I hear them say, we want the right to control and suppress these people, I take that personally. The reality is in politics, sometimes you lose. You know that we start going down this list of things. Well, I want this, and I want that, and I want the other thing, and they're not passing. It must be because of money, and we've got to stop those other people from talking. You know what the reality is? There's people here in this room who sometimes think some of those things are good. Believe it or not, there are. There really are. Lots of people think antitrust laws were too restrictive. Lots of people think those are good things. They may even be a majority sometimes. And vote that way. It's tough to lose. It's tough to lose in politics. What I remember is that before we had all these limits on spending is when you got the Voting Rights Act, and you got the TVA, and you got the Rural Electrification Administration, and you got Social Security, and you got Medicare, and you got Medicaid. That's when you got the first establishment of welfare. We could do okay. We could do okay if those are your objectives. Now, let's think about this discussion. Who would be against the right to know? Well, the NAACP has been against the right to know. They want the Supreme Court about it. NAACP versus Alabama. Because the state of Alabama said, we don't know who you're going to talk People have the right to know. You're trying to influence our politics. As the NAACP was. Right? And of course, had the NAACP been forced to make public its membership and donor list in Alabama in the 1950s, huh, would have been curtains for the NAACP. Their money and support would have dried up in an instant. Who wants to know? Unions, unions, they could oppose the right to know. Thomas V. Collins, the unions went all the way to the Supreme Court, fighting for their right to remain anonymous when they organized workers. Religious proselytizers, Stratton versus Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. People trying to organize boycotts of businesses. Tally Reed, California. Over and over again, we believe that the government does not have a right to know about all the aspects of our personal life, and particularly they don't necessarily have a right to know about our politics. They don't have a right to know that I gave 100 bucks to a particular candidate or PAC. Where does that right come from? If I were to tell you that the government's going to institute the Patriot II Act, 
because they need to keep terrorists out of U.S. politics. As part of the Patriot II Act, all your political activity would be reported to the government and kept in a database, but they would make that database accessible to companies like Halliburton. Right? And more, we'd want to know who you talk to about politics. That would go in the database. <coughs> you would flip out. Right? But that's what the Federal Election Campaign Act is. When you give money to a candidate, a path, a cause, the government takes it, they put it in the database, they record it, they make it available to hell or anybody else who wants it, your nosy neighbor, the guy who, who's mad at you about something, you know, whatever else. The second part of that is not currently in the law, but a lot of people want it to be. They want to know bundling. Well, what is bundling? Bundling is when I call up Greg and say, Greg, I think this can't spread that much with some money. Greg says, you well, I don't know why I'm not gonna money. But in my scenario, he does say I'll give him money, right? Now the government now wants to know that I gave the candidate money and that Greg gave the candidate money. They want to know that Greg gave the candidate money because I talked to him. Now, I think you should be worried about that. Maybe you're not. I am. So there is some argument to limiting disclosure of what's proper disclosure. There are benefits to disclosure, and they can't come about. But as has been pointed out, the Supreme Court did not change disclosure laws. They were not an issue in Citizens United. So to the extent that one is unhappy with the current state of disclosure, that is not a problem with Citizens United. In fact, if anything, Citizens United made very clear that Congress can regulate a lot more if that's what they choose to do. Thank you. 
Coolidge, what evidence is there that the corporations have made any warrants? Well, I provided quite a bit early on in my following remarks, but you know, just, to, just to elaborate a bit, you know, the revolution was a revolution against not just the king or the king's military arm, but also the king's economic slash governing arm on this side of the Atlantic, the crown corporations that had not just economic powers to establish treaties or to trade, they had governing powers, governing powers that established political rules that resulted in the oppression of the colonists. So when there was a revolution, fresh in their minds was to be sovereign, to be self-governing, to be self-determining over all sources of organized power. The king, the king's army, and the king's crown corporations. And therefore, the way they decided to make sure these entities would be part of we the people, subordinate. And it's not a suppressing language, it's a liberating language. Our liberation, to make sure that our creations would not become more powerful than we the creators. That's inspiring, to make sure that we would never ever replicate a system where a power was controlling us, we the people ever again. And that's why that source of definition is not in the Constitution, but at the state level, where the chartering was done, because that was the level that our founders felt more comfortable in at. So it was at the state level where the charter was again used as a democratic instrument to define, to liberate, we the people. That's what it's all about, and I think we have lost, we have forgotten, because our minds have been compromised, sad to say. It has uh, been a deliberate effort. Go back to the Powell memo, look at his writings, go look it up. Um, his effort to say we have to get an activist court that uh, works at making sure that corporations have greater rights. Never intended. Thank you. Mr. Coleridge, I uh, had the rare privilege of living through the 60s, and I remember those halcyon days which brought us. You know, I, I wasn't alive during the New Deal, but I do know that the halcyon days back when bag money was uh, possible under campaign finance laws, that we still nevertheless got Social Security and TVA, the Cold War, Vietnam, a lot of goods and bads. And I've also noticed that since there have been incremental finance, campaign finance, and electoral reform laws, that we seem to be posed with the prospects of bipartisan rollback of environmental protections, the privatization of enormous gaping chunks of the federal commons, endless war, and a great many um, rollbacks of regulations and social security that we the people had thought were more or less permanent items in our national culture. Do you believe that there's any correlation between the evolving role of corporations in our political discourse and the present that we face and the future that we face? If I understand the question correctly, I would respond, yes, and it's not just the rising power of corporations, but of the political influence of money that uh, a lot of it springs from this uh, previously referenced Supreme Court decision in 76, Buckley versus Vallejo, that uh, gave certain greater liberties to spend money and make it more difficult to control the spending of money in elections. And I happen to believe in uh, public financing of elections, mandatory public financing of elections which can't happen because of Buckley versus the um, I think every candidate who is a deserving candidate who has the ability to uh, deem themselves a credible candidate, and there have been a number of systems out there uh, that have come up with mechanisms to determine that, uh, except for a small number of uh, private contributions, show that they're not just some crackpot. 
uh, candidate, that if they meet that threshold, then they would receive a limited amount of uh, public funds to run their campaigns. Um, now, we have never had that kind of mandatory system. We have had and still have a couple of voluntary systems. Uh, State of Maine is the longest running, and where that uh, has gone, I think, since Mr. Um, Smith would know the mid 80s, I think, or the 96, 96, past years. That uh, there's much more diversity of candidates. Uh, you have people without money who run, who have their voices heard, whose voices are not drowned out. So I think it's a combination of, yes, corporate power that has resulted in this, again, massive disconnect and disillusionment. And I can go over the numbers again of their latest polling results of people who say that since Citizens United passed, they think that there's less uh, voice and that our, that our political discourse is less effective and they have less of a role in the shaping of uh, what takes place in our society. But that's only part of it. It's also big money that comes from individuals. And I think unless we deal with both elements, both dimensions, then we're never going to get to the place that we want to be or come to know we're never going to get to it, of course. It's evolving, and uh, it requires constant vigilance. But we're never going to come to know place until we sort of abolish both corporations or not people for the short term. Who thinks government is most corrupt? Who's most likely to say, oh, yes, very, very corrupt and citizens of right? Well, people whose candidate or party lost the last election tend to think government's corrupt. Pretty natural. People who've been recently divorced are more likely to think government's corrupt. People who have lost their job are more likely to think that government is corrupt. Uh, people who've had almost any bad experience of death in the family are more likely to think government's corrupt. In other words, these are our kind of war shock tests of what people are, are thinking. And the polling data is also very interesting, too, because, for example, the polling data suggests that people think that much higher contribution limits should be allowed than are currently allowed. If you ask people, you know, how much of a, are political contributions corrupt? Oh, absolutely, they all say yes. What level do you think they become corrupt in? It's considerably higher than the current federal limit, depending on, on what polling you've done, between five and ten times higher than the current federal limit. So it's a, it's a mixed bag when you really start to get into a little deep. If you ask people, do you think tax should be allowed to give money, they all say no. If you take the evil word tax out and you say, should people be able to pool their resources to support the candidate of their choice, you get about 70% say, sure, of course. Because again, that's what it's all about, right? Because people should be able to get together and pool their resources. That's why, by the way, this old King's Crown Corporation stuff is, is also to me irrelevant. Because those are corporations, as Mr. Kohler just said, exercise government power given specific government monopolies. That's why they were disliked. They were much more akin to what we have today, like the, the beef board, where all the beef producers have to join and they'll pay for ads, or the dairy board, and that's it. Where it's much more akin to mandate that you buy insurance, health insurance from a private insurance company, right? That's the kind of thing that they were rebelling against, not free enterprise and not people joining together in their enterprise. Now, on this question, I think the question should be, you know, uh, well, let's talk about public finance. Let's just go back a little bit since I think. No, no, we have to be a deserving candidate, a credible candidate, and not just some crackpot before you get the government financing. Well, who's going to make those decisions? Well, it's going to be a government board. It's going to be a government board run by the people who are in power. Sometimes they will be conservative Republicans, right? And they're not going to be really hot necessarily on letting in the people that you want. In fact, again, we typically find if you start putting those threshold mechanisms on there, um, you can cut out a lot of really good people. If, if you set them real low, you do get, in fact, a lot of people that most people look at and say are crackpots. And it hasn't worked that well. Maine, the state of Maine, virtually every economic indicator and other indicator has gone downhill since they put in public finance. And it's not created more diverse candidates. They have less diverse candidates. We studied that extensively at the Center for Competitive Politics. And you can look at those reports at campaignfreedom.org and see that all the claims made for public financing in Maine and Arizona are simply not true.
Thank you. Gentlemen, we now move to closing statements. I ask that you uh, tell us what you foresee happening with the Citizens United decision, or actually what you want people leaving here tonight to focus on. First, uh, that would be Professor Smith. Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Here's what I would say. The problems of money in politics are real. They are not created by the form in which people participate in politics. There's nothing magical about a corporation. Right? Exxon isn't going to become the most wondrous thing in the world the day it becomes a partnership. Right? And the day it becomes a partnership, the American Friends Service Corporation is going to become better. Okay, or it going to become worse. Right? There's nothing magical about that form. So focus on what really matters. And this is the question is how our democracy ought to work, right? How we ought to work and what role does money play on that? And when it comes to that, look hard. Think hard. Don't let the gauze and memories from days past get by freely. I can't tell you how many times in the second group people said, oh, it's been a bank's much more than I get this little super packs. And as I said earlier, do you not remember Willie Hope? Do you not remember Swift Hope that's for true? Do you not remember the little ACP running the ad of a man being dragged behind a truck and saying George Bush was responsible for that? Do you not remember ads and ads and ads and campaign and campaign and campaign? Look and see, are they really more competitive races or less competitive races? Are incumbents more challenged? Do some incumbents used to have a free ride after they got a campaign now because the super bad goes in the dumps and some money in their campaign? Are we hearing fewer ideas, really? Are voices really being drowned out in the last couple of years that we've heard in the past? Or is it possible that maybe we're hearing some different voices? We're hearing voices like the come on like the voice of Ron Paul. You didn't hear that in Republican campaigns a decade ago. We're hearing voices that are extended by super PACs, Gibbons and In other words, this is the time for thinking seriously about our democracy and not thinking in cliches and not just accepting the idea that money is evil. But it's time that we get serious and operate like serious Americans. And if we do that, I think we'll realize that we're very fortunate to have the First Amendment that keeps the government out of this. There are countries all over the world throughout history that have had First Amendments of some kind that guarantee freedom of speech so long as you operate in the appropriate manner so long as you would deserve to be credible and not just some crackpot. And one of the things that's made our country better is that we've not had those kind of limits on our First Amendment. The First Amendment isn't perfect, but it's probably the best thing we've come up with so far. Thank you very much. Mr. Coleridge. Well, I'd like to begin by thanking the uh, sponsors, the organizers, and the attenders, all of you, for coming out uh, this evening. We could have been doing a lot of more, uh, maybe, uh, in a lot of day things. Hopefully not, but uh, maybe more enjoyable things than we could have seen. So thanks to those of you uh, for organizing this and for being here. Um, you know, to me, it just comes down to the basic issue of who rules? Who decides? Where is the Citizens United decision going from here? It's not deterministic. It's up to us. It's an open question. If we accept sort of, sort of the line of it's sort of inevitable, it's irrefutable, it's irresistible, just sort of go with the flow. You know, just sort of keep things going, maybe tweak something here and there, then we're going to end up where we're headed which is more and more money, and more and more feeling by more and more people. As the one sign at the one Occupy in Washington, D.C. said, our country is broken because the system is fixed. And I think that describes where we are headed as a country. Yes, there may be more voices that big money has resulted in more competitive races run. But who are those candidates? What is their economic background, both incumbents and challengers? Are low-income people, people without resources, are their voices heard? Maybe there's a reason why you hear candidates talking right and left 
about upper class, middle class, but who talks about the poor? If you were made candidates of any of them, talk about the poor. Maybe, just maybe, that has something to do with the fact that big money is not coming from the poor. Candidates are not poor or low income. Maybe there is just some slight correlation. I'll end by simply saying that uh, one of the sponsors of this uh, group, this program tonight, is the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And one of their members out in California, Jan Andrews, uh, came up with an interesting statement. She said, you know, there's two legal fictions historically in our society, in the Constitution. Uh, one is that people are property. That was called slavery. And we abolished it. The other is that property are people. We call that corporate personhood. Short name. It needs to be abolished as well. And I think if you want to do something, not have this inevitably go, but it's up to us as self-governing people to decide the course and decide the fate. It's not up to corporations to decide. It's not up to our elected officials. It's up to us as it's always been up to us, as it always was to drive in people who were never, ever included in the Constitution to begin with. Women, people of color, people who were 18 years old, they got in, they drove themselves into the Constitution because of social movements. We have to make sure we drive corporations out because of the social movement. Thank you. Thank you.